Now, you've heard very nicely from Dr. Colson the large burden of lung cancer. You've heard about the importance of early screening. And what I'd like to focus on now today is the power of prevention and really staying well and preventing cancer. Now, you may wonder why is a cardiologist standing here before you to talk about lung cancer? And first and foremost, I am a preventive cardiologist, and I believe that we have the power to prevent heart disease by reducing risk factors. We also have the same power to prevent lung cancer by reducing those very same risk factors. So I'd like to give you some good news, I think, about empowering you to prevent lung cancer. So we do have some bad news. As you've heard, we are exposed to a myriad of environmental risk factors that promote cancer, whether it be lung cancer or other cancers as well. Smoking is on top of the list. But dietary factors feature very large in cancers. We also know that obesity promotes cancer, and finally, that exercise, or importantly, lack thereof, also promotes cancer. Now let's think about where we are as a society, and let's talk about the state of our health of our population. Unfortunately, seven out of 10 American adults don't exercise regularly. We know that 80% of people in the United States over the age of 25 are overweight. Further, we know, according to the Center for Disease Control, that the most common causes of death in the United States are first tobacco, accounting for over 400,000 deaths annually, poor diet and physical inactivity, contribute another 400,000, and finally we know that alcohol, another 85,000. So that's the bad news. But the good news is the fact that all of these risk factors are modifiable and largely preventable. Smoking, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about how you can take positive steps if you are a smoker to quit, or if you're exposed to passive smoking, how to reduce that risk. Dietary factors. We'll learn that, in fact, your mother was right. You should eat your vegetables. We also know that obesity plays a very large part in risk factors. And finally, that the more we exercise, even if it's just slight increases in our physical inactivity, we can make a positive impact on our health. Now let's talk about smoking. What many of you may not recognize is that we've really only learned about the detrimental effects of tobacco within the last 50 years. So as recently as the 1960s, as you'll see here, physicians were promoting tobacco products. On the left, 20,000 physicians find that luckies were less irritated, perhaps because they were toasted. Uh, more doctors smoke camels in the uh, slide or the graphic on the right. So we've really learned only about the dangers of smoking in the last 50 or so years. What do we know now about smoking? We know um, that 33% of smoking-related deaths are actually related to heart disease. So again, this is why a cardiologist is talking to you about this. Unfortunately, we recognize that smokers die on average about 13 to 14 years earlier than non-smokers, not only from cancers, but from heart disease, other lung disease, uh, the vast array of conditions that are caused by smoking. We know that smoking is an independent risk factor in individuals who have heart disease for death in, in these patients. And finally, if we look at smokers compared with non-smokers, that smokers have a three-fold increased risk of heart disease. So again, I had to get my heart disease message in there, but you can see there are many, many reasons why we need to address tobacco use in our society. 
If we look at this slide, these are uh, data showing us the leading causes of preventable death and premature death in the United States. Smoking accounts for about 20 percent. Diabetes, you can see there, 7 percent. Asthma, 7 percent. And obesity is an important factor, even more so, in fact, than smoking if we look at preventable disease and premature death. Now, it was mentioned the role of exposures such as passive or secondhand smoke. Let's think about this. Over 100 million non-smokers are exposed to secondhand smoke. This causes, unfortunately, about 15,000 non-smokers to die of lung cancer each year, and that 35,000 non-smokers die of heart disease each year just based on exposure to passive smoking. That was some bad news, but I have some really good news. The good news is, is that smoking cessation at any point in your life offers significant health benefits and that these are often quite early, surprisingly so. So if we look here and look at last cigarette, we can see that within 20 minutes of stopping, you have a dramatic decrease in your heart rate. Within just 12 hours of your last cigarette, you can have a dramatic reduction in carbon monoxide levels, such that they drop to normal. Two weeks, we already know that the heart attack risk begins to drop and that lung function begins to improve. At two months, we see other risk factors, such as the lipid profile, begin to normalize. And within one month, or over the course of the next nine months, you'll see dramatic reductions in coughing and shortness of breath. So those are very significant short-term benefits. Now let's look at the long-term benefits. Again, if we look at the first year, the risk of heart disease is actually half already of a smoker at one year. We know that five years, the stroke risk is reduced to a non-smoker's risk in just five years. At 10 years, we recognize that lung cancer death rate is about half of a smoker's, and the risk of other diseases, infections, are similar to what a non-smoker's risk would have been. And finally, over 15 years, the, the risk of heart disease is actually back to normal for that of a non-smoker. So you can see there are dramatic early benefits of quitting and there are dramatic long-term benefits of quitting. And not all of these are related to lung cancer, but they're all related to improvements in your health. Now, the other question that comes up is, is it too late for me to quit? And we have very strong data to answer that question and say, no, it's never too late to quit. And these are data from a study of male physicians showing that quitting at any age actually increases life expectancy. So if individuals quit at age 35 to 44, you can see there's an additional nine years of life expectancy. If you quit 45 to 55, you still gain six years. Quitting at age 55 to 64, still three additional years of life expectancy. So we have the power to prevent much of the disability from smoking by quitting at any time. Now let's talk a little bit about nutrition and cancer. This is something that people don't always talk about and don't recognize. We know that diet plays a very important role in the development as well as the prevention of cancer. Some have suggested that nearly 30 percent of the risk of cancer may be due to a poor diet. So an apple a day, really true that, in fact, the National Cancer Institute has estimated that foods such as apples can redu reduce the risk of lung cancer by 50 percent. 
So just incorporating certain foods into the diet. We also know that in women, diets with uh, dairy products and increased vegetables are linked to lower risk of lung cancer. And in some, a black tea may also be linked to a lower risk of lung cancer. Uh, dark green leafy vegetables, such as collard greens, spinach, broccoli, have important antioxidant benefits, as does orange juice, and those can be associated with less cancer. And finally, foods such as tomatoes are also associated with lower risk. We see that green tea may be a powerful antioxidant and that that can also potentially uh, reduce oxidative damage. As I told you at the beginning, your mother was right and there's overwhelming support that fruits and vegetables reduce lung cancer. In one, particularly, in one particular study in the Netherlands, looking at a multi-ethnic cohort, there was a 50% reduction in cancers by an intervention increasing fruits and vegetables in those populations. Unfortunately, very few of us may be incorporating five or more recommended servings of vegetables into our diet. So shown here are data over the last several years, suggesting that over the last decades, we've done very little as a U.S. population to increase our consumption of fruits and vegetables. Now let's talk a little bit about obesity. We have very good data suggesting that the more obese countries around the world have more cancer. And obviously obesity is associated with multiple things, whether it be the industrialization of a particular society, the kind of diet that one eats, but it's a marker for increased cancer risk. And what you can see here is that if we look at the U.S. and Canada, Australia and Western Europe, as well as most of Russia, you can see dramatically higher rates of cancer uh, tracking uh, tracking across those countries. We also know that there tends to be a relationship between overweight and cancer and that this um, may do with how you carry weight. We think that body size does matter in cancer risk and that obese individuals have a higher risk of all cancers, not just lung cancer. We know that the more overweight or obese, the more risk. And that this apple shape that we see here, carrying the weight across the middle, tends to be much higher risk for cancer than what we would say is the pear shape, carrying weight more in the hips. Now let's think about obesity in this country. We have an obesity epidemic on our hands. Shown here are data from 1995, looking at states across the country. And you can see that in light blue, 10 to 14 percent rates of obesity in these states. Pick your favorite state and watch what happens over the next several decades. If we look at 1990, we see that many more states have moved into individuals being uh, 10 to 15 percent of the population in these states being obese. In 1995, we can see a lot more dark blue, suggesting that 15 to 20 percent of the population is obese. And just in the next five years, dramatic increase such that a very substantial proportion of the U.S. has more than 20 percent of its population in yellow being obese. 2001, continued increases in obesity. 2002. So we see that obesity dramatically is increasing and that it's associated with cancer risk. Now let's talk about exercise. Now most people think about exercise of needing to get on the treadmill, needing to exercise 45 minutes a day every day. But the reality is, is that if we just move from being less active to more active, we can have important health benefits. This is particularly true when we look at cancer. In fact, a study showed that even moderate exercise can improve 
outcomes and reduce the risk of lung cancer. This particular study showed that moderate exercise, even gardening, one to two times per week actually was associated with a lower risk of cancer in, uh, in wide ranges of populations. Now, exercise is incredibly important. We need to incorporate more activity in our daily lives. How can you do that? This doesn't need to be complicated. It can be easy as taking the stairs when they're available, uh, walking around the building for a break at work, take a parking space that actually is a little bit further and don't spend hours looking for that close parking space. That will save gas as well. And spend quality time with your dog, not like this individual who's putting the dog on the treadmill while he sits very comfortably in his chair. And actually use your exercise equipment. Don't use it to hang your laundry on. Don't put it in a corner. Take it out, dust it off, and get moving. So what can you do? I'd like to, to present to you that you have the power to prevent lung cancer. If you have lung cancer, you have the power to improve your outcomes with it. And by doing many of these things, you can actually reduce your risk for heart disease. First and foremost, if you smoke, quit smoking, or even reduce the amount of tobacco that you use. If you're in an environment where you're exposed to passive smoke, try to change that or modify your exposure. In general, we know that people who are as lean as possible without being underweight do better whether they have lung cancer or not. We recommend that people are physically active at least 30 minutes a day. Again, doesn't need to be on a treadmill. It just needs to be more activity, more steps, brought into your daily life. We also know that individuals who limit the consumption of what we call energy dense foods, high fat, high calorie foods, actually have lower risk of cancer as well as heart disease. And as I mentioned, vegetables, fruits, whole grains are all important in improving health overall, lung cancer and heart disease specifically. As a cardiologist, it wouldn't be a talk of mine without saying you should limit red meat, but I think the real message is everything in moderation. And as much as there's concern, or often you'll hear, the use of supplements to so-called prevent cancer has not necessarily been proven. We can use our diet, we can use foods, and incorporate appropriate foods and get all the benefit we need without necessarily turning to supplements to do that. <laughs>